I've previously touted on this channel multiple times that Epstein-Barr virus, EBV, is the cause of MS, or at least part of the causal pathway, an intrinsic part of the pathogenesis of the disease. But is it really? Recently, a randomized trial for ATA-188, an immunotherapeutic developed to treat EBV, was ineffective in treating MS. In fact, the placebo group did better, had a higher rate of confirmed disability improvement. And the pharmaceutical company that develops this drug, Ataro Biotherapeutics, decided to stop development, at least for MS. They are still pursuing development, I believe, for other EBV-related diseases, such as post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder and perhaps Burkitt's lymphoma, so they're not necessarily giving up on the drug. Now, of course, there are many reasons a drug could fail. Maybe there are technical reasons this specific drug is ineffective for this specific disease, or at least the individuals included in this trial, the EMBOLD trial. It could be they were treating MS too late. Maybe you have to intervene early on before EBV has induced pathogenesis of the disease, perhaps close to the onset of the disease. Again, perhaps there were other technical considerations, but one reason this study failed could be that they were treating the wrong thing. Maybe EBV is an epiphenomenon. It's not part of the core cause of the disease, and I'm going to make that counterpoint in this video. Now, of course, I concede there's a lot of evidence linking this virus to multiple sclerosis. So almost everyone gets infected with this virus. Only the minority get symptoms and actually get the syndrome of mono, mononucleosis, glandular fever, a disease that teenagers could get, sharing saliva that can give you upper respiratory tract symptoms, along with severe fatigue, sometimes for a prolonged period of time. People who have a history of mono have roughly double the risk of MS. This very famous study in the U.S. military looked at people who had antibodies against Epstein-Barr virus suggesting they had prior exposure to the virus versus people who did not have such antibodies, suggesting they've never been infected, and people with antibodies have a roughly 30-fold greater risk. In fact, people who test negative for antibodies against EBV have an extremely low risk of multiple sclerosis, suggesting it's almost a necessary but not sufficient cause of the disease. Of course, most people infected with the virus, roughly 95% of the adult population in this particular study, most of those people don't get MS, so there are other environmental and genetic factors as well, but it was almost as if you had to have the virus in order to get the disease. Other studies, such as this one, show that people who have higher titers, higher levels of antibodies against the virus, have a greater risk of MS, almost in a linear fashion, suggesting that more ongoing viral activity promoting a greater immune response is associated with the disease. There are also population studies that look at autopsies of people with multiple sclerosis with variable findings, but some people, especially people with secondary progressive MS can have lymphoid follicles. They could have lymphocytes, clusters of white blood cells in the meninges, the coverings of the brain. And some people can actually have lymphocytes that test positive for EBV. And there are a lot of plausible basic science mechanisms that could connect this virus to multiple sclerosis. For instance, there's evidence that this virus can infect B lymphocytes, the white blood cells that make antibodies, and change them, sort of immortalize them, and make them immune to regulation from CD25 positive T lymphocytes. And that's part of the pathogenesis of MS, the escape from immune system regulation that causes the attack on one's own nervous system. But remember that correlation is not causation. Just because two things are linked doesn't mean that one thing causes the other. Maybe, for instance, the primary abnormality in MS is the immune system itself that's causing this abnormal reaction 
to EBV, and we're just perceiving it as the primary cause. And there's a lot of evidence that the immune system is abnormal in MS. For instance, even the genetic studies on MS suggest almost all of the genes linked to risk of MS have something to do with the immune system. For instance, the gene most linked to MS risk, HLA-DRB1-1501, if you have two copies of this allele, you have an eight-fold increased risk of MS. What does it do? It's part of the major histocompatibility complex type 2 that influences how your immune system interacts with the environment. What does it have to do with Epstein-Barr virus? Nothing. Same with all the other genes linked to MS. They're related to immune system regulation. People who have an immunosuppressed state, people who take immunosuppressant medication, they're not at increased risk of MS, even though they're at increased risk of various viral infections such as cytomegalovirus and other opportunistic infections. So reconsider what we're seeing in terms of evidence in this light. For instance, people who have mono, they have double the risk of MS. Well, maybe people who are more likely to get MS, they have sort of an overreactive immune system. And so when they get exposed to this virus as a teenager, they have this strong immune response. They get significant symptoms and prolonged fatigue, whereas other people getting exposed to the same virus maybe just get an upper respiratory tract infection that goes away quickly. They don't get diagnosed with mono because the symptoms are just like any other cold. What about the antibody results? Well, maybe everyone, literally close to 100%, actually get exposed to the virus, but not everyone tests positive. Maybe if you clear the virus quickly or you eliminate most of the virus so that it's very dormant, in other words, your immune system is functioning normally, you don't generate these high antibody titers because they're not necessary to control the virus. But with an abnormal, deranged immune system, you end up with this persistent virus and high viral loads keeping it under control. Consider this, what you're looking at is the seroprevalence, the percentage of people who test positive for antibodies against EBV in different countries. And you can see that in many countries, the seroprevalence is greater than 90% by age six. So even a six-year-old has a very, very high chance of being exposed to the virus. Now let's assume that people have a linear rate of being exposed and infected with the virus, which probably is isn't true, but just stick with me for a moment. You would have a 90% risk at age six, a 99% risk at age 12, because the remaining 10% would have a 90% risk over a six year period. You would have a 99.9% .9 risk at age 18 and a 99.99% risk at age 24. Now again, this isn't true. Some people may live different lifestyles, be less exposed, for instance, or have a better immune system. But the point is, when we say 95% get infected with EBV by the time they're adults, or by the time, for instance, the Harvard study was completed, that may not be true. It may be that everyone gets exposed to the virus, but some people don't generate a high antibody tighter, and we can't see it on the test results. Tests are not perfect, and they may not perfectly document exposure, and even serology for other viruses that are used as serious diagnostic tests, like HIV and hepatitis C, although highly sensitive, are not perfectly sensitive. There are definitely false negatives. People have the virus in their body, but it doesn't show up on the test. Now for HIV, that's an ongoing infection. The body generates a prodigious immune response to the virus. It simply can't clear the virus because there's prodigious replication of the virus. It makes sense that that would be a more sensitive test because there's ongoing viral replication, ongoing immune attack. Epstein-Barr virus is different. The virus can become dormant. It could hang out in B lymphocytes, be hidden from the immune system for years or decades, and it makes sense that the test may be less sensitive. So again, when we see a negative anti-EBV antibody in an adult, we may say that person's never been exposed to the virus. That may not be true. They may have been exposed and infected with the virus. It may lay dormant in their body, but they have a better, more regulated immune system that does not have a prolonged, unnecessary immune response. And hence, that same person has a more regulated immune system and is unlikely to develop MS.
There's some other evidence that could undermine the connection between EBV and MS. For instance, other diseases that are caused by EBV should be epidemiologically linked to MS. But look at this map of Burkitt's lymphoma, the B-cell lymphoma that's caused by Epstein-Barr virus. It's more common close to the equator, the exact opposite of multiple sclerosis. It's more common in countries where AIDS is prevalent because immunosuppression causes the virus to become active and could lead to B cell cancer. Again, why isn't multiple sclerosis common in the areas where Burkitt's lymphoma is common? If AIDS causes this virus to become active, and viral activity causes MS, why isn't MS common in these regions? Another example of an EBV-related disorder is post-bone marrow transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. This is a condition where after a bone marrow transplant, usually used to treat cancer, there can be a very severe activation of the immune system driven by Epstein-Barr virus infecting lymphocytes, infiltrating various organs, can be very serious, even and fatal, but bone marrow transplant does not cause multiple sclerosis. In fact, it can even improve MS even if the transplant is done to treat an unrelated cancer and can even lead to long-term remission of MS. Another thought is that if EBV causes MS, shouldn't everyone with MS have the virus? But that's not exactly the case. This study done by Emmanuel Labont at University of California, San Francisco on pediatric MS showed that actually less than 90% of kids with MS test positive with antibodies more than the general population of kids without MS, but definitely not 100%. Now, I posted this on Twitter and someone responded that they re-examined this cohort and some of these individuals test positive for anti-MOG antibodies and may actually not have multiple sclerosis, but nonetheless, there's still some who do have MS who did not test positive for the antibodies. Is this because they weren't infected by EBV or like I said before, it's just not a perfect test? Also, they found that the controls had relatively low rates of seropositivity, so I don't know if there was something wrong with their methodology, but maybe they're onto something. So I hope I've sown some doubt into your mind that the EBV theory of MS may not be as strong as you previously believed, and treatments of Epstein-Barr virus with antivirals or even a vaccination early in life to prevent EBV may not be successful in treating the disease. But I should end the video with my own personal opinion, which is that I do think most likely, I'm not certain, EBV is part of the causal pathway of MS, and I'll tell you why I think that. Going back to the Harvard study, they actually looked at serology of various other viruses, including other viruses that have been purported to be linked to multiple sclerosis in the past, such as CMB, cytomegalovirus, human herpes virus 6, and other viruses, and they're just not. No other virus is linked to MS except for Epstein-Barr virus. So if there were an overreactive immune system causing these differences in serologies, you would think we would see something in serologies to other viruses as well, but it's just not there. It's just Epstein-Barr virus. And there would have to be some unique molecular mimicry phenomenon to have a specifically different antibody reaction against a specific virus. Now, this is not impossible. For instance, people who have lupus, sometimes they'll have have abnormal testing for syphilis unrelated to infection. So it is possible that an autoimmune disease could influence the immune response to a specific antigen associated with a specific infection, but it seems that it's less likely in my opinion. Another thing in that same study, they looked at people who converted, who seroconverted, they were negative at the beginning and they later turned positive, and they were able to demonstrate that that conversion was a associated with an increase in a different blood test, serum neurofilament light chain, which is a marker of damage to the central nervous system. In an individual, it really doesn't mean anything because it's highly variable, but in groups of people, it's associated with central nervous system damage and multiple sclerosis. And on a group basis, on a population basis, they were able to demonstrate that it tends to go up only after you seroconvert. So that that suggests that an infectious event 
is triggering that central nervous system damage. Now, of course, you could explain it away by saying something changes with the immune system, causing both dysregulation, causing these elevated titers and damage to the nervous system. Of course, it's possible, but it does seem a very distinctive finding that you see signs of objective central nervous system injury only after you test positive for that antibody against Epstein-Barr virus. The final thing is I think some of the basic science studies suggesting changes in the behavior of these B lymphocytes when they're infected by the Epstein-Barr virus, which by the way is probably incidental. Probably EBV is doing it for its own purposes. It wants these B lymphocytes to survive so that it can survive, so it can hang out in the body forever. It can't stay within the epithelial cells of your mucous membranes forever. Your immune system would fight it off. Off, it really does seem there's very strong evidence that this virus changes the behavior and, as I said before, immortalizes B cells and changes the way they're regulated by T cells. So looking at all of the evidence, I do strongly suspect that Epstein-Barr virus is at least part of the causal pathway of MS. I'd be interested to know what your thoughts are and let me know if you have suggestions for other videos.